Nothing like a nice cool breeze in the winter. <laughs> Through every crack you can find. Well done for making it to church today. Some of you came in a bit wet because you had to travel literally a few metres to get to the door. <laughs> yeah, swim. Some of you, yeah, swam to church today. Well done. I'm start lifting up and it become like an arc type <laughs> building. <laughs> a very leaky boat it would be, I imagine, from the breeze coming through. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to pray. I really want God to be on display today and his word to be on display. Lord, we just pray that you'd be glorified through your word. Your will be done. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. You are the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And we come, we come, <laughs> sometimes I feel reluctant to say humbly because that's presumptuous over the, <laughs> the pride of my heart. But Lord, I want to come to you humbly. We want to come to you humbly. We want you to be God and us to be not God <laughs> in our own mind. So let your word ring true in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, uh, we talked about Saul. Just tweak some things here, just because I'm fussy. We talked about um, Saul and someone else named Samuel. Oh, well done. Sorry, we don't usually have a back and forth, so I understand that. Uh, <laughs> Saul and Samuel. Um, today, we're going to talk about King David a little bit, a little bit. There are series and series of sermons that you can do on King David. King David's really cool because he's one of the most talked about uh, people in the Bible, so you can get a lot out of it. Um, so I'm just going to pick a few bits out of, out of uh, his life today for us, if that's okay. You can read all about Samuel, I mean <laughs> David, <laughs> and Samuel, funnily, funnily enough, in First and Second Samuel. So... Um, uh, if you want to pick up, there's, I don't know, about 12 or 15 chapters or so that, that talk about his life. And actually, I, I mean, I thought about it last night. Last night I, I read about um, 14 chapters in a row and I thought, I always, you always have this mentality that the Bible's so long. It's not that long in, with stories and things. I mean, if you set aside an hour, you could get through the whole life of David and probably a bit of Saul and everything. It's if you want to read a good book, I highly recommend the Bible. <laughs> it's great. And the cool thing about Samuel, um, and it's, it's quite story-like, it's really engaging and you really get into the characters and things, it's really cool. So anyway, we're going to look um, at this sermon now. <laughs> King David, let's go to the first slide. And I'm, I'm just using the ESV today, just to change things up. So uh, this is our first passage of Scripture today from First. Samuel 17, verse 34 to 37. Uh, and, and, it, and it gives a little background and, and summarises a bit about David's life before he became king. And for those that don't know, uh, David was just a shepherd boy. Um, it says actually in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 4, that God was seeking a man after his own heart. And he found that man uh, tending sheep, uh, one of the low light, lowest of occupations you could have back in the day. David was one that was despised by his brothers and that was revealed a few times, especially his older brother. Um, in fact, when Jesse, his dad, was asked to present all his sons, he did not present David. He kept him away out with the sheep. He had a lot of very, what he would see, I oh know, it's pretty sad, hey? He had presentable brothers. So he presented the brothers and even Samuel, the prophet, looked at the oldest and thought, surely this is the one. He's very presentable. He must be the guy. And then he got a rebuke from the Lord. He said, Samuel, man looks on the outside appearance, but God looks at the heart. Do you know that God does not look and judge things the same way as we do? I mean, we, we see people and esteem people according to careers and talent and all sorts of categories that we esteem people. I'm telling you, God does not esteem people the way that we esteem people. And so David was plucked out from the sheep pens 
probably they weren't pens back then, but uh, I think they had rock walls and then an opening and then the shepherd would sit at the opening. That was sort of the way in and out. Um, so the actual, <laughs> it's a really cool uh, uh, analogy actually to, the, to what we know as the gospel. Everything in the Old Testament leads to Jesus. But um, David, as a young boy, would have sat at the opening of the, of the, of the wall to his sheep and he became the gate between everything coming in and out. And so David is like a Christ-like character to reveal about Jesus. It's very, uh, it's important that the, the Bible and in Samuel it talks about David's weaknesses because it shows us that David wasn't Christ, but it was, he was almost like a foretaste of what Christ is like in some of the attributes of him. And sometimes when we read the Bible, we, we are liken ourselves to characters like David and very little to characters like Saul, even though if we were honest with our heart, we'd find ourselves alike and probably a lot like Saul at times if we were humble enough to admit it um, and we fall short. It's, it's a good thing to have a so, sober judgment over your own uh, shortcomings. That's called humility. And without humility, we can't come to Christ. <laughs> right but David would have been at that gate and he was no one's coming in and out and there was only one way in and one way out and David was that shepherd humble shepherd that was there and that's what Jesus is for us he's the only way (laughs) to be led out to the open pastures he is the way the truth and the life you know narrow is the gate that leads to life and few are those who find it and even in the situation of David they didn't even find him where's all your sons I mean Samuel knew it was one of these sons but he couldn't even find him. It was hard to find. <laughs> but God highlighted him. He wasn't highlighted by human beings. He was highlighted by God. And sometimes, and I, and I felt this last week when I was talking about the Word and just the nature of God, I'm thinking this is not appealing to us as human beings. It will be really hard for a human to find the gospel and to accept it. But God is the one that highlights the truth and highlights the way. Actually, as human beings, we can't find the way, the truth, and the life. (laughs) No one seeks God, says in Romans. But it's the grace of God that highlights himself to us to give us an opportunity to respond to him. It's an incredible amount of grace and mercy. And so Dave was plucked out of the sheep pens, brought before them, and he was the anointed one. Um, and, and, And... this was in transition from Saul. God had rejected Saul as king. He, he said he regretted that he had made him king and he was going to find a man after his own heart. And he found David. And the, the path to greatness for David was different to Saul. Saul was a nobody, anointed king and became a somebody and didn't have the character in his life to carry him through. David was a nobody. The flask of oil was poured on his head it says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, that the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David. And do you know what he did? His great exploits were, after he was anointed king of all Israel, it was to go back to the sheep and look after those sheep. And the very thing that his brothers despised, he did not allow his own heart to despise. He went back to the sheep and he served the sheep. And so for David, the path to greatness was, was different. He wasn't launched up and elevated in front of people's eyes as someone great. He was pushed away from everybody and was called, he believed in his heart, to serve those sheep. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David to lead all of Israel and the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully on him to continue leading a bunch of sheep. What great place to develop as a leader, to do something when nobody's watching, to do great exploits when nobody's giving you achievements and medals and special honour and recognising you. He was doing all that behind the scenes when no one's watching. And God is looking at our life today and He can see the things that we do in our life when nobody else is watching. If we only do things for the esteem of other people because of our fear of man, (laughs) then it reveals a character in our heart that we're not really worshipping Almighty God, we're worshipping ourselves. 
If I want to do great exploits for the Lord because it makes me feel good and look good, I'm not really doing it for him, I'm doing it for me. (laughs) And so Saul fell in that trap, didn't he? He was doing great exploits and then he turned it and set up a monument in his own honour and worshipped himself. David wasn't going to go down that same path. And even though David was a man after his own heart, God still allowed him to go through the time that he needed to of being with the sheep. As good and, and, and as well-rounded and humble that we think we might be, God loves us so much that he will allow us to go back to the sheep to save us. And that's what he's going to do for you too. So we'll continue reading in the story. (laughs) But David said to Saul, this is when Goliath, you know the story of David and Goliath? You know, one of the most famous stories. I read it to to, um, uh, Samson, the non-kids Bible version, and he's like, whoa, (laughs) pretty gruesome. And it was, reading all those chapters just by myself, I'm like, wow, this is full-on violent uh, stuff going on here. Um, All these people getting killed left, right and centre. Yeah, interesting. And so what happened was Goliath was presented. Before this, um, David was brought into the king's service. He played the harp, an evil spirit sent from the Lord, had come upon to torment Saul. The only way he got relief was when David was discovered as a great liar, as far as the instrument liar. He wasn't a liar. (laughs) You're a great liar player. You play the liar really well. And so he did. So he played that and he was anointed. Remember, the Spirit of God came on him. And so this evil spirit that came on Saul, when David came to play and the Spirit of God was on David, obviously the, the evil spirit had to go. You see, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. <laughs> may th- when the Word is preached, may it be inspired by the Spirit of God, as was designed when the Word was, were put on the scrolls initially. Inspired by the Spirit, preached, inspired by the Spirit, because if I preach or teach Uh, Like the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, it will be dead and evil spirits will happily hang around. And I know I've talked about this, but it's so exciting, I have to say it again. When the evil spirits were residing in the synagogues and the temples, they were happy to be there when the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were preaching. But when Jesus opened the scroll and he taught with authority in the spirit of the Lord, the enemy had to yell and scream and get out. And when David was in the room, and he started to play the instrument, the evil spirit couldn't remain in the room. Even though he was the king and he was the shepherd boy, the shepherd boy had the spirit of God on him and the the spirit of God that was on him overpowered any other thing in the room. Didn't matter the kingly authority and who was given the human authority at the time. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Where light is shone, the darkness has to flee. (laughs) It does. It does. Have you ever turned on a light and you're fighting darkness and you see the light going out because the darkness is overpowering it? No, the light just switches on. <laughs> it's the activation of something. Death is the, the, the falling asleep or the coming to nothing of something. That's death. The Spirit, God who created the world, is life. When he speaks, it's life, it's activation. When the enemy moves, he tries to deactivate us, deactivate the world. When when it's dark, it's a deactivation of the light. And wouldn't the enemy love us to deactivate our light? Wouldn't he love us to be intimidated by the evil all around us? That's not the plan for our life. We're called to have the Spirit of God in us. Isn't it wonderful that the Spirit of God was poured out unto every living human creature? (laughs) That the same Spirit of God that was resting on David, anointed on David, lives within us to be the light of the world. And the enemy would want us to shut up, 
be intimidated, be fearful, and deactivate life and light in us. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and read this scripture. I haven't even read much of it. Here we go. Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. That's what I used to do. Isn't that a good thing? You're, fo- you're talking to the king, right? It's funny because King Saul kind of forgot about David. It's like who, later on it goes, who are you and who's your father? It, I find that a confusing part of the scriptures, but maybe just played in the corner of the room and sort of just listened to the music or he was, had such an evil spirit he was barely aware what was going on. I don't know. But it says, David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. What's happening is, and I kept trying to say this story, and I'll try and say it again about Goliath. Goliath, this is giant. You, you think of a 10-foot basketball ring, as you all would be thinking about, because you all love basketball the same as me. But his head was like just below that. And he wasn't just a stick figure, t- super tall. He was a big guy. The type of weight of the things he was carrying required enormous strength. You know, he had a, a spear, and the head of the spear was like seven kilograms. I'd be like, ooh, uh, uh, boom. <laughs> but that was a weapon for him to throw it with in tremendous power. This is a powerful giant, right? And so he's coming out and mocking God, mocking God in front of everyone, and everyone is freaked out, afraid, apart from one guy, this random shepherd boy who's got the Spirit of God on him. <laughs> And so when he goes, hey, everybody, nobody wants to take on this giant, apart from this boy. And so he advertises, puts his resume in with King Saul. Hey, Saul, I am a shepherd boy. I mean, that's a good introduction, isn't it? Oh, you've got the job. You're the warrior to do it. But he says, I used to keep sheep for my father. And where, when there, were, there came a lion or a bear and took the lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him. And delivered it out of his mouth. And if if he arose against me, for the times that the bear and the lion decided to take me on, when that happened, because it didn't happen all the time, but when it did happen, I wonder if the bears and lions got to know David. You know, you have territorial lions, they're territorial creatures or bears. And so you do that, you stop running away. I mean, this is what happens. It's a good way to get a lion or a bear out of the territory. The other new lion goes, oh, new territory. It's like, oh, careful. There's uh, one more powerful than you here. And so I went after him, struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. (laughs) Can you imagine that? A massive face of a lion or bear and you've got this boy (laughs) holding it by the scruff of its neck and killing it. I mean, that, I mean, that's facing death in its eyes. That was, that was David's training ground. He's like, this random bloke, give us a break. <laughs> give us a break. <laughs> it's interesting, as a reflection on Jesus, do you know the story of the 99 sheep? Well, I don't know how many sheep David had, But when one was taken away, he went after that and brought the one back. We're the ones that go astray, get caught up in everything, get taken astray. And Jesus has come to take us back and protect us from the mouth of death that wants to consume us, to bring us into safety and security. That's why we have to say, Jesus is Lord. It's silly. As a bunch of sheep, we go around and go, man, I'm Lord, and try and face a lion and a bear. That's not going to work well. Jesus is the one that can conquer sin and death. We're not the ones that can do it. And he rescues us. Praise him, mighty Lord. Amen. What's the next slide say? Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from this hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, the Lord be with you, right? Isn't it interesting? In the sheep pen when no one's watching, David did extraordinarily great things. And then he finally gets an audience with the king. He can talk to the king now, back and forth. This is his opportunity to go, hey, Saul, I killed that lion. 
I killed that bear. I am a mighty warrior. But to see this, the pattern that God is seeing in David's heart and developing him later on for kingship is this. He did mighty exploits, but he was aware that he wasn't the one that did it. He gave glory and honour to God. He recognised he was a lowly shepherd boy and when the Spirit of God came on him powerfully, he, know, he knew something was different. But he couldn't show off about it around different people because he just had sheep around him. When he did great things, he attributed the credit to God. That's so important that we do that. And God is learning to trust David. And here we go. He says, the Lord delivered me from the hand of the Philistine. But something happened in Saul's life, uh, Saul. Something happened in David's life a little bit later on. And he forgot who he was and where he came from. And I don't know about you, but I am that same person <laughs> where I forget who I was and where I came from. Let's go to the next scripture in this, and, it's, and it starts right here. This is David. Now, there's a big jump in, in, in timeline now. Big jump. Saul had been trying to kill him over and over again. David had two opportunities to kill Saul, who was trying to kill him, and he refused to. He refused to take matters in his own hands because he trusted in the Lord. There's a lot of stories in, in between here, but here, and he's done exploits, and now he's set up his kingship, and now he's conquering left, right, and center. This David, who was always on the front line, always the one, that boy that said, I'll go and I'll destroy Goliath. I want to be on the front line of what God's doing here. How dare that? This is, this is a change right here in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab. That was the time that kings were supposed to go out. And if, out of all the kings, David had the heart of a warrior, was on the, a front line guy in the thick of the action. But in this time, he decided to sit back. It wasn't like the season was all the time for kings to go to the war, but for whatever reason, springtime was that time of the year, kings were to go. And he stayed home and he sent someone else instead, Joab, his, uh, the, the general of the army, and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. It was an unusual thing. Something has shifted and changed. What happened in between this and the next story is, while David was just in this kind of non-active mode, he saw Bathsheba bathing naked on top of the roof of the house. A good lesson out of that is, ladies, don't bathe on the tops of your roofs, especially when you've got a big building over it and people can see. But anyway, uh, that's beside the point. <laughs> David saw he had nothing else to do. Boredom, inactivity is a dangerous place to be. Yes, he was safer being on the front lines with arrows and swords flying around him than being complacent in his home, looking around, seeing what might come his way. <laughs> that is a breeding ground for sin <laughs> and temptation. It's a breeding ground when you're inactive. And so we, we, we come to this next, and what happened is David, because he had all the authority, and now he's getting a little bit entitled. He's the king, he can stay home, and he sees someone he wants, and he goes and gets what he wants. Sleeps with her, and she falls pregnant. And then she tries to convince her husband to come home and sleep with her, and so it looks like it's his baby, not not. Her husband's baby, not his, tries to cover it up. He refuses to because he goes, no, I refuse. The Ark of the Covenant is over there. And in honour of God, the husband of this wife refused to, to sleep with his wife. He stayed at the doorway. David tried to get him drunk to, and he still refused. And he got sent out and he didn't do it. So David made a plan. Expose him on the front line and get him killed. That's the only way I can find out a way. So this righteous man was killed in battle to cover up David's errors. But the thing is with David, he had this transparent relationship with the Lord. And in his own entitlement and pride, pride conceals our eyes to see clearly. 
It covers up our heart and squashes things down when pride comes in. He became entitled, he became proud, and he thought he could hide like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden away from God. And David had never lived like that growing up. Something had changed. Pride had kicked in. Entitlement had kicked in. Complacency had kicked in. And he thought he could hide from God. And do you think God was interested in David, a man after his own heart, to hide from him for very long? No, he wasn't. It wasn't. Let's go to the next scripture. <laughs> There's a prophet. Samuel's died now. Nathan is now the prophet. And then the Lord said to Nathan, sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up. And it grew up with him and his, with his children. It used to eat off, the morsel, off his morsel and drink from the cup and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. What, Nathan, what God is doing through Nathan right now is he's bringing him back to an emotional memory of when he was the shepherd boy and he loved his lambs. David loved his sheep so much that he risked his life to pull them out of the mouth of the bear and the lion. He was despised by all his, his family. All he had was his sheep. And he invested heart and love into his lambs and his sheep and he protected them. And what Nathan was doing is he, was ignoring, he wasn't addressing the immediate situation. He was going, telling a story that brought up the warrior, the shepherd warrior that instinctively wanted to protect the sheep. And you can see in this next part of the story that that memory and that thing that was in David's heart was starting to rise up. Let's have a look. Now there was a ah, oh, now there was a traveller uh, to the rich. Now there came a traveller to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then, da in, then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. Okay. So he said, then someone else, the rich guy came, didn't want to use one of his many sheep, stole the lamb and butchered it. This lamb that was like a daughter to this guy. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. What David is doing is, I'm seeing a lion and a bear taking away that lamb. How dare they? I'm going to destroy that. And the saddest thing was revealed to David, and he didn't see it before, but he's going to see it now. Go to the next, next slide there. Nathan said to David, you are that man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Keep going, Liam. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with your sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. And then he talks about all the, 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 ish, the things. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. And it goes on about the consequences. The baby died... Um, uh, oh, no, actually, keep going. You might see. Go to the next one again. Or is that it? Yeah. And so anyway, oh yeah, in verse 13, you said, you did this secretly and, and then, it's, oh, I might as well read it all. Why am I trying to make it shorter? Thus says the Lord, behold, I'll raise up evil against you out of your own house and I'll take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did, seek, you did it in secret, but I'll do this before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you will, shall die. And Nathan went to his house.
Can you imagine what it's like to be David in that moment? Whew. David went from being absolutely furious to destroy the man who stole the ewe lamb and then he found out that he had become that man. Entitlement, pride, complacency. And Nathan was saying to David, essentially as well, in, as, well as other things, remember who you are. Remember where you came from. You're that shepherd boy. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 to 5, I don't know if it's there. I can't remember. I don't think it is. One of the churches is doing all right, but Jesus said this to them, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Remember who you are. Remember who he is. David, you are a man after my own heart. Remember, you're that shepherd boy. Remember, you are the one that was destroying the lion, the bear, and you've become the very thing you hate. Do you think that God rebuked David because he hated him or because he knew who he should have been? He was drawing out the very person that he should have been and he dropped the ball. And when we get confronted and exposed before almighty, holy God, it's for our salvation. It's for our salvation. So that we can come like a little child again, into his presence, knowing that he sees all, he hears all, he knows all. He knows everything that's going on in our heart. And sometimes we go on in life and we deceive ourselves and cover things up. And in our entitlement, in our complacency, we live in darkness and we ignore the things that, are, that we're hiding. But God sees it all and he sees underneath that and he's drawing out of us a person that's going to shine for him. He doesn't want us to live in darkness. He wants us to live in light. He wants us to live in freedom. He wants his spirit to be running through our being, out and about. <laughs> so I'm going to pray. Lord, here we are. In your presence, you see all, you hear all, you know all, you know the deep issues of our heart. And I ask, Lord God, if there be an issue with pride in us, if there be an issue with complacency, you know, if we're distracted and just ignoring, I just pray that you would reveal that to us now, that we would hand that over to you. And we would remember who you've designed us to be. Children of you. Lord, help us not to lose our identity in you by false labels that we would want to put on ourselves that maybe the world esteems. But help us to be branded as your child. And I pray the love that we may have forgotten that you'd bring that to our remembrance and from that simple place we would love you again like a shepherd boy. In Jesus' name, amen. Whew. How'd you go with that one? <laughs> shepherds god loves shepherds man for some reason the lowest of the lows who did he reveal the great king was coming he announced it to the great shepherds the sky was opened up and they saw something angelic going on like no one's ever seen of worship and praise as they announced the coming of the king of kings and the lord of lords <laughs> 
the shepherd was announced as king and then the, the king was announced by shepherds. <laughs> God doesn't look on the outside. He doesn't esteem people the same way we do. Go home and serve your family as well. Go home and be a good friend. Go home and serve the sh- whatever the sheep equivalency is in your life because that's the thing God's looking for. Amen. We've got a beautiful thing ahead of us. We're anointed. We're empowered by the Spirit of God to do things when no one's watching. Amen. Well, have a blessed day. I hope that some of you can come to the lunch at the Edwards place. Uh, There's tea and coffee as well. So have a great day. Amen.